one. Welcome, everybody, to uh, Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center, CUNY, New York City. It is week three for uh, our talks that take a bit the temperature of uh, what is happening and what's really happening. And we heard many, many voices, artists from around the world, but also from New York, um, to talk about uh, the meaning of all of it, uh, what we should be doing or should not be doing, what consequences it will have, but especially really, um, the voices of artists. We hear so much from politicians, virologists, and economic advisors. That our voices, as so often, um, are missing. But I feel, especially now, this is of the utmost importance and to get an honest evaluation. And artists in all societies, in all ages, in all centuries, actually have spoken the truth and were closer to what is going on. Often, we are late, even when we are in the present. We are were educated and our mind formed some time ago, but artists do have that special gift that they're not only in the present, but actually they anticipate um, the future and they have something to say. We should all listen to um, very, very carefully. This week is a little bit of New York week. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, Big Dance Theater with Paul and Annie B, uh, the Nature Theater of Oklahoma with Pavel and Kelly. Um, we're gonna have Melanie Joseph uh, from the Foundry with Aaron Lansman and Aaron Spire. Um, and um, and then we hear from India and Pakistan, uh, from uh, Shahid Nadim and uh, from Abhishek Mumbar, uh, friends uh, also from us. But today we hear from a great organization, uh, institution I have admired very much over time. We also have collaborated many times. It is the Blackfest uh, from New York City uh, with us is the founder and somehow the organizer of it is Keith Atkins, who at the moment is working in Los Angeles. Um, for his work for the stage, but also for the screen. And um, he uh, brought with him three great uh, minds, the writers he feels uh, strongly connected to, who also happen to have time this morning on short notice, but also who he feels um, have uh, something to say. There is uh, Dennis uh, A. Allen II, uh, who is uh, here uh, from us, and uh, you hopefully saw all the bios on the great HowlRound webpage. Again, thanks for HowlRound at Emerson College for hosting us. And there's uh, Francois Benson, um, who uh, is joining us from New York, right? And, uh, and Lisa Strom. Actually, I'm, I'm in Florida. Oh, you're in Florida, <laughs> right, right. Florida. right. And Lisa, Lisa is in uh, Florida. Dennis also is in New York City. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, let's start uh, right away. Um, Keith, so what's going on? How do you feel? Well, um, can everybody hear me well? A little mm -hmm. bit louder, maybe speak a bit louder. Yeah. A little bit louder. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, yeah. I, uh, you know, this is a very obviously troubling, heartbreaking, um, humbling moment in global history with COVID-19. Um, and we all are now quite aware that the black community in particular, are being hit the hardest as far as fatalities. Um, and I think that for me, um, initially I was sort of um, feeling the global sort of impact of what was happening. And then recently because of the information about our particular demographic, my heart and my mind and my spirit is much more invested in what is happening to my community. And then also why it's happening to our community. Um, I think uh, for me, and I'm, you know, Dennis, Prince, Luce, and Lisa will have their own sort of contribution to this conversation. But for me, um, the health care inequities within our community is a very, very real thing. And it has been real for a very, very long time. It's not brand new information within the Black community. We are always aware that we have to be extra careful about walking into a hospital and what, that, what may happen while we're in that hospital. But for me, there's another more revolutionary reaction that is needed, which is empowering our community around health and fitness, because clearly this administration, from the evidence and the data that we've been provided in the last couple of weeks, they have not really taken a, a strong enough stance to protect this country's marginalized and more susceptible communities. And the big question is why. Um, that may be another conversation to have at another time. But with the knowledge of knowing that there is a sort of potentially culture of disregard and expendability when it comes to black and marginalized people, then what does that mean for the black and marginalized people? Should they self-empower? 
through politics? Should they self-empower through health? Like, what does that mean? And so that's kind of where I'm sitting right now as I navigate this wave of trauma that is happening on a daily basis. So. Mm. Mm. Any one of you? Yeah. I'm right in. So. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I think um, I agree with everything Keith just said in terms of uh, taking on a new wave that's taking on a new wave of grief when we are starting to see the statistics um, in the disparities on how this is impacting the Black community. And I think for me, uh, there was a moment that really made it real. And, you know, I, mean, I think everybody's seen it now, the, the bus driver who went viral, who talked about a woman coughing and then uh, he died several days later. And uh, he's kind of like a symbol of um, how marginalized communities are treated and it's not even just about race but socioeconomic communities um you know people who are on the front lines not just doctors and nurses but people who are working in our supermarkets and bus drivers who are getting people around and there's a kind of ne neglect um that the government uh treats them with and that many of us um, treat them with, uh, that, uh, is sitting with me, you know, and I, and I know for me, I've been thinking a lot about how I can be of service and not just as an artist, just as a human being. And, you know, um, what is the best way for me to be of service? You know, it may not be at this moment, through my writing, there may be other things that I can offer. Um, so uh, it's very deep, <laughs> and, uh, um, and I'm I'm reminded of how much I need to just take my time because it's so much to process. It's mm -hmm. so much to process, and so before I can even jump into action, I really need to process everything that I'm experiencing okay. myself. Absolutely. You know, and the fact that when this first came on to the scene, COVID-19, there was this belief that Black people could not get it or that mm -hmm. we were not dying from it or could contract it. And then it seems like every single case that comes out, we are the face of it. And that from cities, all major cities across this country, it's Black people who are dying. And that's very scary. And I have a lot of people in my family who are service workers who are central workers, who are nurses, who are bus drivers. I have two siblings that have um, compromised immune systems. Uh, my brother has asthma, my sister has MS. And so their health has really been on my mind heavily. And the members of my family who were constantly putting themselves at risk, taking care of the larger community. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes I don't know how to feel about that. I don't know what to do, how to feel, what, what to think, what I'm able to do. The only thing I can think of right now is keeping myself as safe as possible and trying to be of service in any way that I can, if that's through speaking to someone, if that's through using, um, using comedy, I don't know, using, having a group cry, um, cooking with someone online, any, anything that's simple, anything that's human, anything that's just about being and sustaining, I think, is something that I'm really trying to focus on, keeping it very simple and sending out continual prayers and spirits to those that are keeping us afloat during this time. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I echo what everyone else said. Um, I find myself really um, looking at the privileges that I have um and how blessed that i am um and also um, in terms of being able to take a second to actually process my grief um, um and that i have a language um to be able to process the grief um, that that i have an emotional intelligence uh, that i have a family that is supportive that i have friends that are supportive that i have a roof over my head 
Um, right now, I'm in New York, but I'm, I'm in Long Island specifically. Um, I'm in Hempstead, Long Island, uh, in my childhood home. I'm with my wife and my two parents who are elders. Um, they're in their 70s, so they're high at risk. So every time I do have to go out or I do go shopping, I, I'm worried about bringing something back home. Um, uh, full transparency, my mother recently had a stroke exactly two weeks ago. And so that hit home uh, in terms of the families who have people in hospitals that they cannot connect to, that they have no idea what's going on with them, uh, that there is a, a feeling of helplessness uh, that I, we're all experiencing on some level. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it really hit home for me two weeks ago. Um, I am lucky enough to be somewhat isolated from the world as opposed to people who are in the city. But at the same time, like I said, I'm in Hempstead, which is also somewhat a epicenter in Nassau um, because of, again, the workers, because of everyone, trans the, the bus depots and the people who are essential workers who can't not work. Uh, and so um, Hempstead tends to be a forgotten <laughs> city in Long Island uh, because of the high minority pop population. Uh, so just really uh, figuring out how to prioritize my grief, uh, what I can deal with in terms of uh, where I can come to the acceptance of the grief process and what I have to uh, take my time with uh, because I may be stuck in the angry phase for, for one uh, section of the grief and I may be mm -hmm. stuck in the depression phase and another section of my grief and so really taking the time to really process where I'm at um, especially since we're all in close quarters uh, you don't want to project and put it onto your loved ones for what you're going through yeah. so um, that's really where I'm at mm. so what phase are you in at the moment mm. uh, you know this morning uh, this morning I found myself uh, in the depression uh, phase. Um, I checked in with the news. I saw the numbers. I recognized that um, in terms of reflecting on how America has treated uh, those that identify as Black, uh, those that they identify as Black, uh, knowing that this is a continuation and, and so it's going to be ramped up. Um, and really thinking about in terms of the Black community, um, it, it is now the narrative, how the narrative may switch to, it is our fault, right? Um, it, the narrative is going to switch to the reason that it's spreading is because of black people um, and the fear that comes behind um, what that may look like in terms of people's a ability to move throughout the country or throughout their own cities and towns. Yeah. So that's where I'm at right now. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting for me, like, I'm not, um, I'm not sure if I'm experiencing grief or not. And we've had this, actually Dennis and I, and Lisa and Chris, we've had this conversation around, because we actually meet <laughs> every week um, as a group of people. Um, but we've had a conversation around grief. And I feel like what I'm going through is more of a bracing um, because I know the metaphor has been used, um, the tsunami. Uh, the COVID is as, as a tsunami and sort of like the water being pulled in and sort of, you know, exposing like the ocean's bottom and sort of seeing that, but also understanding that the wave is coming. And then once the wave hits, there's casualties involved and sort of looking around at the casualties, but also being aware that there's another wave coming. So it almost makes it impossible for me to completely grieve, I think, because I'm so busy bracing. I'm still bracing. I'm still like, you know, what Dennis was saying and Lisa just sort of like bracing and concerned and having anxiety around family members and community members who I know are high risk. And, and you know, and to make it very clear, like I think the sort of conversation right now or the narrative that's being spun is that poor black people or poor Latinx people are the ones who are being impacted the most, but it's black people of all classes. It's, it's Latinx people of all classes. It's not about necessarily people who have who live in food deserts it's about underlying conditions that may be triggered by or have origins historical um, environmental social economic like all those things are, are involved and so that makes mm -hmm. for me like i'm concerned about all of us all of us 
Um, I saw online last night, there was a young man, young African-American man in the hospital. And he was talking about, he went in because he thought he had um, COVID-19. And what he discovered was that he actually was a diabetic. And he said, like, isn't this a crazy time to discover my, I have an actual underlying condition that I didn't even know existed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there is a go, I go back to like the health awareness within our community and not depending on the institution to sort of help us and, and mm-hmm. sort of guide us because they drop the ball on us all the time. Um, and we just really, I feel like there really needs to be more empowerment within our own community about teaching each other the resources that we have and know to just keep us sustained because this is gonna happen again. Obama talked about this five years ago. He said in five years, there's likely gonna be an airborne virus that's gonna be deadly. He said that five years ago. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just in this place of bracing um, and I'm, it, it's exhausting, it's stressful. I have to jump rope, you know, in order to just sort of like pull the anxiety out of my body because I could worry all day long about my community. Like it would literally probably make me sick. You know? mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I just feel like I'm, bra- I'm bracing. Um, yeah. And it's, it's nerve wracking because we need testing. We need mass testing mm-hmm. across this country. A lot of us are sitting here and we don't know if we're positive or not. And they're not giving you a test if you're not demonstrating any any of the major symptoms. But we're discovering day to day that the symptoms can vary. Right. Um, I was reading recently, and I think I shared this with the group on Friday, that um, now a symptom is your skin burning, having some kind of burning sensation in your skin. Did any of you hear anything yeah. like that? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> diarrhea. Um, uh, red, the red eye. The, the red, red having eye. having having red eye. Um, people thinking they're having allergic reactions or have, or that it's, they're suffering from allergies, and that actually could be a symptom. That could be a sign that could lead to more dangerous things. Mm-hmm. So it would be nice for us to know what our status is, and so that we can know that we're not at risk to the people that we love. Because I know, you know there's people who want to go visit their families and they're afraid to, because you could be a carrier and you don't want to put someone who is at risk because of their age at risk. Right. So it's very frustrating to not know what our status is and that that if you want to get a test that you cannot because you're not near death or you're not exhibiting any kind of respiratory issues. I mean, because one person, you can sneeze one day and be dead in five days. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think well, Germany, were, yeah, Oli, go ahead. Yeah. Well, they were uh, on the news this morning, they were talking about the debate about whether um, some states will uh, end the lockdown at the end of this month or in May or in June. And one of the issues is even if people start to go back to work or schools reopen, that most of us haven't been tested. And so <laughs> how can we resume everything when there are people who still may be asymptomatic, who still may be carriers, so um, it is scary to think about how long this will go on. And, um, you know, you talked about the tsunami. For me, it feels like there's just this undercurrent of anxiety that just persists. And I, you know, I, I go for walks and I meditate and I do all that I can to take care of myself spiritually and psychologically. But there's this undercurrent of anxiety that is just like simmering and simmering and simmering. And, uh, you know, I joke sometimes I'll I'll clear my throat or I'll have a little tickle in my throat and I suddenly think, oh my God, but it's serious. It's a real anxiety that's just, you know, waiting to burst. And uh, I imagine that most people are feeling the same anxiety. Yes. And uh, it is really shameful that we can't be tested. Yeah. That we is. all have to live with this. Right. Yeah, piggybacking off the anxiety a couple of days ago, I had to go to the market and I really was terrified to go. I hadn't been out of my house in two weeks. And I have all the gear, I have the mask, I have the gloves. Um, but I was really afraid I had to talk myself into going outside because I'm even afraid at this point to even take walks because I'm in a hot spot. I'm in Jersey City actually. And so we have the highest numbers next to New York. 
And mm -hmm. when I look outside my window, I see people walking about with masks or sometimes without. I still see people congregating in groups. And I just wonder how safe it is. I wonder how safe it is. So the anxiety is very real. And I don't, I don't think that's ever really going to go away. I think that's going to be with us. Um, I don't want to say indefinitely, but you know, definitely until the end of this year. Right. Yeah. I think, go ahead, Frank. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the cases that we had artists uh, from Taiwan also here, um, why they had yeah. few cases, this was rapidly fast testing. The, the, I think the country learned from the uh, SARS virus. Germany has very low cases. And the only reason they say is massive testing, about 500,000 people a week early on. <clears throat> here you have the feeling baseball teams have access to the testing. Yes. You hear of the top managers, you know, who have access uh, to the testings. Their cases in the New York Times was described that doctors order 25, 50 kits just for themselves, for their friends, families. Mm -hmm. This is on their mind. And uh, even healthcare workers who have often then the black ones at the CVS pharmacy wrote letters. They said, ethical, you know, that mm -hmm. we can, but you get 25 just for yourself, but you can order them because you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, how can it be that the richest country in the world can produce 50 cents masks? How come that is not able to produce after two months testing that um, what's what is wrong and I like I think you're right the underlying conditions so you are feeling for, for your community of course you know it's a long story this is nothing new but now it comes an extra extra burden on it do you feel um, that people are listening to you are people aware um, of that or do you feel it's not represented in the uh, media and the talks uh, as it should be in terms of how it's affecting African Americans, mm -hmm. yeah. community, I feel like I hear people talking about it. They make it a talking point, mm -hmm. but I don't see anything being done about it. I don't see any real action or any real steps taking place to address it. Because in order to address it, you you have to talk about the, the systemic and the, institution, and the institutional racism of this country, which which it seems to me that that is something that the country really doesn't want to do or hasn't really done in any real way or have any real conversations about combating that. So the, the virus, the pandemic right now is just shining a brighter light on the problem that has always been here. Yeah. And those problems haven't been dealt with in any real way. So I hate to sound cynical, I don't expect them to do anything about it now other than to make a point. And in some ways, when I hear them talk about it, I almost feel like they're even trying to blame us for this happening to ourselves. Because they'll talk about well, they they talk about the underlying conditions. They mention obesity and diabetes, and and then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that's they're they're pointing out the reasons, but they're also trying to blame us mm -hmm. for it. Oh well, if if black people just took better care of themselves, mm -hmm. if they did this and did that, then may, maybe that's why they're more susceptible. But they're we're more susceptible and have all of these conditions because of our experience in this country because of not being taken seriously, especially within the medical industry, be, be, for not being believed when we, have, when we have issues. So it's all connected. So are they doing anything? No, I don't think they're doing enough. Yeah, and the same, uh, uh, in a way, people in power and that politics yeah. who, who uh, cut the money for the hospitals, cut mm -hmm. the money for healthcare workers, don't pay yes. the right salaries. They're not the ones who say, stay at home, you're allowed to go out and put perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, uh, blame to it, but they call it the China virus, the Wuhan virus, others instead of saying it's a global problem. And, um, yeah. and um, it's, uh, it's hard. So how do you deal with it then um, and as artists? Um, um, do you feel this is impacting your thinking, your work, or is it just a confirmation? I remember once Judith Molina came to the Siegel during um, the financial crisis, and she said, we always knew the system isn't working. I don't know what people are talking about the Lehman when it collapsed. And he said, you know, we, we have been making plays for 20 years about this or 30 or 40. So um, how, how do you feel? Do you feel this is something different? Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like, um, and I was talking to you earlier about this, about as far as like the Trayvon Martin moment in our country um, and uh, the Baltimore moment, like moments of that are that are illuminated around um, 
the culture of expendability when it comes to black people, like police brutality and police surveillance, that sort of thing that I felt in those moments required an immediate reaction uh, because it was impacting each other's lives, each, each other's lives within our community almost every single day. We knew somebody, it was us being policed, it was us being pulled over, our cousin, our brother, our sister being you know, shot and killed. Um, and I think that demanded artistically like a real immediate sort of reaction. In this case, um, me personally, um, and I think, you know, um, Francis Luce was speaking to this, like, I just really feel a need to be still, to really kind of understand, you know, first of all, sort of like to brace myself, you know, within this pandemic, within this virus, this attack, but also sort of understand how I'm feeling, because I'm not quite sure how, how I can feel artistically when there's so many things being thrown at me as far as my own morality, mortality, right? And so like there are people who are reaching out as far as commissioning and micro commissions and monologue slams and things like that. And I just don't know personally if I can offer anything right now. Um, I don't have any resolutions or solutions because I feel like I'm in the middle of it. Um, and I'm also not very interested as an artist to just sort of be doing things to keep myself occupied if it's not somehow connected to what's happening right now. You know, so it's like, it's, a, it's like a, you know, I just feel like I'm walking in sort of a fence between not feeling the need to do something, but also not wanting to be a part of things that are not a part of what's happening. You know, um, that's just kind of where I am right now, artistically. So. Um, I'll add, I mean, I do think that it is definitely a time to, to look inwards. And so that could mean um, completely being still, not engaging in any new artistic work, but it also could mean um, continuing. I mean, I, I'm still writing a lot is journaling, but I also have pieces that, that I started and that I've tried to kind of come back to during this time. And what I often find is whatever I'm working on whatever's happening around me in my life informs what I'm working on. Um, and it's not for me to kind of force it, but just as long as I'm present and emotionally available to whatever's happening in my life, it will inform the work. Um, and I also think it's a, it's a great time to connect with other people. Um, one of the things that I am doing artistically, I'm Fortunately, I, I have a position with the Fountain Theater in LA. I'm the community engagement coordinator, and we've been looking for ways to connect with our audiences. So um, I started something on Saturday where we kind of do, it's just kind of like a salon. And uh, this past Saturday was the first one, and it was really an experiment. You know, I had a couple of musicians and uh, I allowed space for people to just check in. And I was really surprised and humbled by how much people wanted to connect with others. Uh, we had about 32 people, I think, who attended. And uh, I mean, I hope they don't mind me saying this, but you know, the Fountain's audience base is more on the elderly side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I could really feel their uh, appreciation to just have a space to connect with other human beings and to just be heard, just to say, this is how it's been for me. This is how I'm feeling. Um, I made calls, I made individual calls during uh, the week leading up to it. And I remember there were a couple of people that I called uh, who were really transparent and said, look, I'm elderly. I don't know how to use Zoom. I would love to do it, but I, I just don't know. And I kind of had to walk them through it. And it really made me realize how isolated a lot of people are, and particularly people who aren't as comfortable with um, technological apps, you know, can really feel left behind at this time. So for me, that's, that's a way where I feel like as an artist, I do, it's a skill set that I have as an artist to be able to connect with people and engage with people and all kinds of people. And so even if I'm not writing or producing new material, that's something that I can offer. I can create spaces for people to engage the same way as 
as theater artists, we create spaces for people to come into a theater and have a shared experience together. I can still do that without necessarily being in a theater or bringing a play. I can still create a space for people to have a shared experience together. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll touch on that really quickly. Uh, I was thinking about it before we got on the call and interestingly enough, all the work, um, my through line uh, with all the work that I do is, is dealing with untreated trauma um, in the African-American community specifically. Um, and so uh, coming out of this, um, when we do get on the other side of this, it's going to be so much more untreated trauma. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and so I, I don't see anything, at least thematically, in terms of my work changing. Um, it's something that I feel like needs to be unpacked. Uh, again, you know, uh, we right now have the privilege of having an internet and having a computer and um, having the education and having the access. And I think um, most, um, most people don't have that. Um, and most people don't have the opportunity to take the time to even think about how am I feeling about this uh, because they're so stuck on survival and how am I going to make it to the next day? And so uh, I feel like it's, it's my responsibility as someone who is privileged enough to take a time to be like, how do I feel about this? Um, to try to express that in my art uh, so that somebody sees themselves and, and gets some sort of feeling, um, uh, some sort of feeling of respite, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah. That's where my that's where my mind's at right now as as an artist and as a writer specifically. It's interesting too when you say that I think about like so much of the African American theatrical and literary canon or even visual canon is coming out of Black people's you know um, navigation of the American experience, mm -hmm. which has a lot of trauma involved in it. Mm -hmm. Like it's like trauma, triumph, trauma, triumph. You know, um, so it's interesting, like you say, like, yeah, because your work does sort of, not sort of, it does deal directly with trauma. And I wonder too, like, because the friends of mine in New York have been talking about the sirens. And even though I hear sirens here in LA as well, but there it's, people are saying like every 10 minutes is a siren. And because the streets are desolate, ice, like, you know, deserted, that, that's the only sort of sound they're hearing. And at least four or five people have said, um, I'm afraid that I'm gonna have serious PTSD after this is all over, just simply because of the sirens. Mm. Um, feeling like they're in the middle of a war zone um, and people are being pulled out of their homes and literally vis like visually seeing people pulled out of their homes and put into ambulances. Um, that has, that's gonna have, like that by itself is gonna trigger some deep, you know, mm -hmm. things, you know? And how do we, yeah, how do we sort of move out of that? Like, how do we, how do we, well, I guess I'm going to answer my own question. Like, because Black people have always <laughs> um, been able to sustain themselves in some capacity um, through trauma, you know, institutional mm. trauma. But perhaps this is a little different. I don't know. I, I think it is so important more than ever right now for artists, especially, to listen to what they're going through not force themselves to do anything that they don't want to do or need to do and listen to that voice. I think having all of this time to not do anything is such a wonderful gift. I mean, I would have preferred that it, not, that it happened under different circumstances, but if we can just get still, mm -hmm. I think many of you have echoed that and listen to that voice and listen to the trauma or the turmoil that is within us and deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis and be honest about it and let things sort of come up for us naturally. I think that is probably one of the, the greatest gifts that we can give to ourselves right now is to stay mm -hmm. steeped in our authenticity, um, stay steeped in listening to that voice that sometimes we don't always get to listen to because we're consistently inundated with so many other things that we have to worry about is just staying in the moment, mm -hmm. yeah. So you <clears throat> don't feel um, what others do feel like in the moment. They produce something that's for the screen, um, or I, um, 
you feel the community is under attack and let's just reflect, let's see um, what we're doing. I know La Mama does Monday evenings, kind of more or less, mm -hmm. even shows um, to keep the spirit up. So for you, it is very different. We had a, a, a conversation last Friday with uh, our good friend, RST Tanag, who is in Burkina Faso, uh, who would say, you know, uh, 300,000 people die in the year, the malaria, no one cares. Mm -hmm. There's now people, you know, in, in Europe or in, uh, in America, uh, white people, of course, he said, you know, some die and, you know, numbers and the world stands still. Mm. He says we can't afford vaccinations against measles. There's not enough to cover the bases and nobody cares. Mm. Um, and then, you know, we all know that uh, America bought a mask away from France or Germany, you know, on the tarmac, on the airports, bought, say, maybe pay four or five times and it didn't go to the people who ordered it, who had already paid for it. He said, what about my country, you know? They can be, they cannot be protected. So, um, what is wrong with the world becomes so deeply clear. And do, do you feel it will politicize your work or your your family, friends? What does what does your family say and you? Do you feel this is a turning point? Well, I mean, if I could just jump in really quick and just say this about Burkina Faso, I think that that's an interesting. Um, commentary because the black in my experience and my understanding um, from my generation back to my great grandparents generation who I actually knew that their experience in this country has always been an experience of invisibility that this something could be happening for a white person a more privileged white person on one side of town um, maybe like you know there's a health crisis and so all the resources are sort of like provided to that particular person or that community but on the other side of town, when there's a black person or a black group of people experiencing the same thing, it's a neglection. There's a there's a expendability um, quotient that happens, and so I think that black people in this country can also say that this is happening to these people, these people, but you know we're not being seen. We're not. This is mm -hmm. always happening to us, which yeah. is what I was saying earlier about like there's an institution and, and a history of um, uh, disregard for us and also there's an institution within our own communities to fight and create movement so we can have equity. That's been an ongoing journey for us since the 17th century in this country. Um, so again, like what's happening to us right now is deeply troubling because it is a pandemic. It's happening all over the world. That makes it ex extraordinarily troubling. And what makes it devastating that the illumination of our own experience here is clearly disregarded. Because you think about like all the experts like Dr. Leanna Wen and Dr. Gupta and other sort of, you know, sort of high-end scientists who have been saying for weeks that the, our administration have been briefed about the incoming COVID-19 and the impact it was going to have. And so understanding how those briefings operate, they give actually specific information. Each person sits there and provides specific detailed one through 10 information, list of information. And I'm certain without a doubt that in some of those briefings, if not all of them, they were aware, our administration was aware of the impact this was gonna have on the black community in large urban centers, the black and Latinx communities in large urban centers. I cannot imagine they did not mention that. And so because of that, and the disregard and what's happening to our community right now, as far as this virus is concerned, is just deeply, deeply troubling. Um, and I and I do feel like it's a little different. And I do feel like there needs something else needs to happen um, because this is going to happen again. Viruses are going to get stronger, just like climate change is getting stronger. And you know, all these things are happening. It's not. Um, I don't know. I just. No. It's important to just sort of say that the Burkina Faso world is also the Black American experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Similar in that in that way, in disregard. He doesn't have masks. You don't have masks. You know, <laughs> you know he can be tested. You know, and it's hard um, for all of us. Um, what does your family members? What is on their mind? Maybe you could share a little bit. I mean, maybe um, 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 Dennis Allen. You know, is it so? For two weeks during lockdown, your mother had a. Well, she had what? What ended up happening? She had a stroke um, mm -hmm. Saturday morning. Uh, I heard her yeah. fall. It was about seven in the morning, mm -hmm. and 
she had shown all the signs of a stroke, sl uh, slurred speech. Um, she didn't have uh, control of her left side. Um, she was stumbling. And so I called the ambulance. Um, they came, uh, they diagnosed her, confirmed she probably just had a stroke, decided to take her to the hospital. Um, and so I couldn't go with her because uh, no one, no visitors are allowed if, if you get uh, to the hospitals. Um, mm -hmm. And so the ambulance pulls off with my mother and I have no way of contacting anyone. Uh, she goes to the ER and, you know, and the er emergency room on a regular day is crazy. Um, yeah. And now with COVID-19, it's even, it's even worse. Um, and so luckily enough, she got all the tests um, that she needed to get. And also she recovered quickly. Uh, there were no beds. They admitted her, but there were no beds in the hospital. And so they just kept her in the ER space. Um, and so once she got her facilities together, uh, she gave me a call on the cell phone and she was like, I'm, I'm requesting that they discharge me uh, because uh, the reason that I had this stroke is high blood pressure and I'm stressed just being in this ER, worried about who has COVID-19, the TVs are blaring, people are fighting with each other. You know, it's just, it's, it's not doing me any good staying in this ER for I don't know how long. So I'm coming home. Um, and, you know, I, we had to, even though we'd rather she stayed in the hospital, there were no beds. And so she came home. Um, I, luckily, my mother takes care of herself uh, health wise. And so the stroke did not, uh, the mini stroke rather, did not affect her uh, as, as badly as some people. And so she got her facilities back mentally and physically quite quickly. Um, we had to do all the uh, back and forth with the doctors in the last two weeks, but she's been home resting comfortably, um, taking time for herself. Um, one of the things that is, I guess, a blessing in this craziness is that she has nowhere to be. She has no one that she has, to, no one can come over. Um, and so she has to focus on herself and her health. Um, and luckily we have her home. Again, if she was in the hospital, I would just have to rely on phone connections and possibly, you know, nurses, who maybe take the time or not to give me a call and update me. Um, and so I can't imagine for people who are disconnected right now and families who are disconnected right now and have absolutely no idea what's happening. Uh, and so the, you have the anxiety of just what's going on in society and then the anxiety of someone being in the hospital um, and not knowing and not being able to control and not being able to see them until they just discharge them if, if you're blessed enough to have them discharged. Um, and so I think my family, uh, you asked about the family, my family just actually, my, my father's side of the family just did a Zoom call just like this one, just to check in with everyone. Uh, and that my uh, cousin, my older cousin initiated. And it was good for everyone to see everyone. And my, my cousin specifically said, does everybody have their wills in order? Um, if you so have you're not making your wills, your family yes. is making your wills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she gave everybody the task that if you have not written your will and not letting people know where your will and your information is to do that in the next two weeks. And then we're going to check in in two weeks to make sure that everybody does that. Right. And that's a reality. I think many of us run from our mortality and, you know, because of it's an uncomfortable situation and I don't want to think about you dying and I, I, I don't have time for that or, you know, I ain't got nothing. To, I don't have anything to leave you anyway. So what am I thinking about my will for? Right. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have, you know, we don't have health insurance. We don't have life insurance. We don't have our wills in order. And so when someone does passes, now it's even more stress of trying to get those things together uh, and figure out those uh, those steps. Uh, and so right now, what my family is doing is, is really we're looking at uh, what strategies we could put in place just in case the worst case scenario happens. Mm. Oh. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's real talk. Man. That is real talk. That is real talk. I imagine those conversations are happening all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. My sister said something very similar that she is getting her will together and um, getting a conversation uh, with a lawyer to get a will and testament together um, in the event that something does happen to her. Um, so. And she's a healthcare worker also, you said? Or? Um, she, she actually, she works with security. So she's security mm -hmm. in the hospital. And security so she, in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so she, she has to work on many different floors. And she was sharing with us yesterday that sometimes she has to accompany um, people to the morgue as well, um, dead bodies to the morgue. So she's 
consistently always uh, on the front line of something. So um, she's concerned, you know, she's concerned and the hospital is doing their best to make sure that they are protected, um, but um, it's unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel like, um, I mean, just going back to the, to the conversation around art and art making, on the, on, you know, when we get to the other side of this, as Dennis was saying, like, I really, I just can't imagine myself wanting to be involved in anything um, except something that's urgent um, and particularly like something that is both um, illuminating of the problem of this country when it comes to people who are marginalized and people of color, but also work that is, speaks to how to empower ourselves. Like I just, you know, I'm right now I'm working on, um, and I won't name any names, but I'm working on a, a, a television series for a cable streaming company. And the content of the show um, isn't something that I would, like right now, like prior to the COVID-19, I was fine with just working in that space and, you know, getting paid week to week and contributing character and story development, because that's something that I really love to do. Um, and it's a decent show and they have something in, really interesting to say. Um, but now that this has happened and thinking about myself in the future as a content creator, I don't think I could even go back to that show. Not to say that I will not go back to the show, but a part of me is like, can I go back to something that isn't gonna to speak to the larger, the larger sort of conversation around what's happening to human beings, you know, particular, you know, black people, marginalized people, like if it doesn't have anything to do with that in a very sincere and direct way, am I as an artist gonna be able to participate in it? Um, I even think back at some of my other work, you know, some look at the canon of my work, if you wanna call it a canon, but it's just a collection of my own work and think about, okay, what things do I feel are not serious enough or, you know, does it speak to, you know, something that's urgent? Do I wanna share this or should I write something brand new eventually that, is so targeted and so specific. Like it just has me thinking and rethinking about artistic agenda um, and also artistic relationships. Who, what kind of relationships do I wanna have with institutions after this? Mm. Um, will I allow myself to be commissioned to write just a comedy about a bird, you know? Um, <laughs> or, you know, um, will I be much more forceful around like what I have to, like what I will be a part of and what I will not be a part of? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's just a lot of, I'm having a lot of sort of artistic um, responsibility questions for myself. Yeah, I, I remember your play about Seneca Village and Central oh. Park, you know, where African American community left for decades there and then they had to leave because the park was created. Mm -hmm. the entire community destroyed, or perhaps also as a model or for someone to look after and to see if that's possible there. Right. It could be possible somewhere else that, that destruction and a uh, very serious work you did there. And uh, oh, thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, so, but also for, 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 for if you know, for, for all of you, you know, what do you look at now? I mean, let's say um, you say, I can't do my own work now, but what do you read now? Or what do you, or are there plays? Are there, is there work where you think this writer? She had it right, he had it right from a canon of, what do you look at as models now where you say this field, let's, rep let's represent what we do. Is there something? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I'll just jump in. I mean, in, I, immediately I can't not think about Octavia Butler. Yes, that's what um, I was thinking too. <laughs> and oh. the power of the solar. I mean, you Octavia know, Butler, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Octavia, Octavia Butler is, is, is the first thing that comes to mind. And I think I'm gonna revisit her work um, and it's been circulating, at least in my circles on, on Facebook, uh, where people are sharing and, and, and talking about her work again, in terms of how prophetic, um, and, and how did she know, um, and her actually speaking and the interviews of her, um, uh, talking about that. Um, and so, yeah, I, that's the first, that's the first name that comes to mind. Uh, Which book would you suggest of hers to start with if listeners are hearing Octavia about Perhaps for the first time or... Kind of uh, Parable of the Sower would probably yes. be the best to start with. Absolutely. Parable of the Sower, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the great thing about Parable of the Sower, not the great thing, but the intriguing thing about it, it's set in, I think, I think the year 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, but she wrote it in 1992. Mm -hmm. And in that novel, there's like a, like a one central government. There, the privileged lived in sort of towers of security marginalized community, Black and Latinx communities are living in abandoned, gated communities 
where there's like people who are on these hyper drugs called pyro and there's like people who haven't eaten and they sort of exist as zombies because they're so i mean it's really like absolute and it's all about survival it's about survival of like the largest sort of apocalypse mm -hmm. like sort of real time like grounded apocalypse like it's really yeah and also i think what's it, it's written as a journal and i think a lot of artists are journaling now mm -hmm. and i think a lot of the art that's going to come out of this time will be of that first person sort of narrative that journal style um and so i think that that's that's mm -hmm. definitely my, my my first pick uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not reading any specific authors right now or thinking about any particular writer. I mean, I have been thinking about what people's response will be after this is all over. I think there's going to be a wide spectrum of reactions. I think that people are going to want to pick up where they left off, wherever they were artistically. There will be people who will want to dive deeper and write things that are more meaningful to them. Um, there may be people who want to not write at all or just sort of reconfigure or sort of redefine their approach to their art. Um, and then some people will just practice um, radical self-expression and, and not deal with any kind of art or any kind of expression that's not authentic and that's not going to change the world for the better. Mm -hmm. um, I think for myself, um, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. I'm, I don't know where I will be mentally. I don't know what's mm -hmm. going to come up, but I feel like whatever does come up, I want it to be something that is true, something that is coming from an honest place and mm -hmm. something that is fearless. So I think there's, there's gonna be a lot of fearlessness, not uh, worrying myself too much about what people are going to think about what it is that I'm creating. Um, and I also wonder about the institutions too. I, I wonder what position they're gonna be in financially and what kind of work they're gonna to want to produce um, mm -hmm. in terms of what's gonna make money and what's not gonna make money. Are they gonna be willing to take as many chances and many risks with different types of work? Or will they want to go back to being um, as commercial as possible? You know, because there is this idea that after people have experienced a crisis to get back to normal, to get back to things that are fun, to get back to things that are light. And so I wonder what, that sort of schism is going to be, what that battle is going to be after all this is said and done and what people are going to want to focus on, what people are going to want to pay money to see and be a part of. So I'm really, I'm really curious to see how that all sort of pans out and that can change from day to day. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I agree with what everyone has said. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the biggest challenges for me is just remaining present and so it's hard for me to anticipate like what people are going to want to see or hear. What should I write? I can't, you know, I'm, it's for me, it's very day to day. And I completely agree with um, just wanting to stay authentic. Um, some days it is comforting for me to work on material that I've already started. And like Dennis, uh, for me, a lot of my work um, I draw from my cultural perspective as a Haitian American, which for me is very much about representing um, a marginalized community, not just in this country, but globally, and representing a country that has many of the problems that Haiti faces today is because of systemic um, racism. So a lot of my work is already kind of exploring those issues and it's just gonna be about <clears throat> what stories I'm gonna wanna tell after this. And it's hard for me to imagine really what the impact of this is gonna be in the end. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, that remains to be seen. But I, again, I have, I feel drawn to, to be of service in, in a way that might not necessarily have to do with writing you know I really want to just remain open and to to see where I'm needed and um and I'm curious about what other skills or strengths I have that may have been dormant because I've been so focused on writing and on this industry and on producing and on you know um, satisfying what I think institutions want from me um, this has allowed me to really kind of just be open to whatever else, um, whatever skills and strengths I have. Um, and as far as reading, I 
actually have find it very difficult to read when I'm anxious. Um, I already have anxiety. I actually, and I'll be transparent just in the spirit of um, uh, letting go of stigmas, but I, I do take medication for anxiety. It's something that I've dealt with for many, many years. And um, so when there's a lot of anxiety, uh, it's very difficult for me to retain, you know, like, so it depends on the day. Um, but what I have been doing is I've been listening to a lot of Muji. Um, so if mm. people don't know Muji, it's spelled M-O-O-J-I. And he is this phenomenal spiritual leader. Um, I like to listen to guided meditations, but I often find like when the voice sounds like it's from a particular <laughs> place <laughs> it's hard for me it takes me out of it and Muji is just this you know Jamaican man and he's so wise and so deep and he's actually been he's done some talks specifically about the coronavirus he's did a wonderful talk about stillness and um, not feeling that we have to feel pressured to do anything but to look inwards um, so I've been listening to him a lot um, that's one of the things that's been really getting me through. And again, just kind of being open to where I can be of service. Yeah. Now, do you get help from anyone? Is there any theater institution? I mean, Blackfest has been around for a while as a great thing, but also you have all done work. Is there any organization that reaches out, a foundation? Is there a theater say, we're going to commission you to keep you up? Do you feel there is there are messages coming from the outside world towards you, or is there a radio silence? Is everything canceled? The Dramatist Guild, uh, I would say, the Dramatist Guild Foundation for Playwrights, um, even before this, has been a place for playwrights. Um, they offer many resources, and I know uh, when New York and LA went into lockdown, they were one of the first to offer emergency grants and uh, a lot of playwrights have been the recipient of that. Um, so they're an organization for me that has been um, really instrumental in just my survival as an artist. They're a place that I can go to um, for almost anything. I think I met Keith through the Dramatist Guild. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the Dramatist Guild is definitely one. Um, and, the, and the organization that I work for, the Fountain Theater, I feel um, we are definitely trying to be genuine in our desire to just be there for people in, in whatever way that they need. Um, and uh, I don't know, who else, guys? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of different um, institutions that are reaching out and, you know, sort of... Uh, providing, you know, just a shoulder to lean on or like, you know, small grants, um, Fracture Atlas, which is the fiscal sponsor for the new Black Fest. They've sent out links as far as places people can go for emergency grants or micro grants or covering, you know, productions that, you know, where money would have been lost and things like that. I think um, that's definitely happening, um, which I think is important, you know, for many artists because most artists live Paycheck to, paycheck to paycheck or gig to gig, you know, it's gig culture, just like musicians, like all artists, right? So um, I think those things are definitely um, happening. Um, um, but I think as far as like the larger sort of narrative demand, like, you know, sort of the commissioning, I think initially people just started asking for content and sort of, you know, pulling people into content spaces. Um, and for me, without actually taking a moment to be still to really sort of like really ask for a specific thing. So I think people were just sort of like expressing themselves, which I think is very important. Um, but I think that I would like to see more if anything happens, even for my own institution, like creating spaces for people to talk specifically about this situation and not just come on in and just sort of like, you know, unpack whatever's happening. I just want, I want a very specific, um, space where I can feel like I can be honest about the world that we're all living in right now. So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. We are, I feel we are just started with the conversation, but um, we, are, we are coming already um, to an end and uh, we all do miss theater and theater now really proves in a way we're absolutely not essential. On the other hand, 
if a society is working, if life is enjoyable, theater is there and it means it is a seismograph. It's the canary bird. Once theater is up again, it will be the scene that we are safe. Once theater is being done and good theater, it will also show this is a good society, it's a good community that takes care of its artists and its values. Theater always has looked at life and death, but also at life and it's on this side of life and has always engaged it as you all have been. And um, I think, uh, but at the moment, perhaps we all are right. It's a moment to listen, to be still, to uh, understand what we are going through before rushing, you know, to, to uh, writing the first, publishing the first novel or the play, an Italian playwright who was with us, Lucia Calamari said, throw everybody out of the window who's already mm -hmm. calling their agents and say, I'm going to be the first for the Netflix series. So mm -hmm. this is not what this is about, you're misunderstanding mm -hmm. this. But I also agree with all what you say that, you know, this highlights what's already there, that marginal communities are invisible, that are not on the agenda as they should be. What is underlying, the underlying anxiety we all have, so they are caused by something underlying that is really, really wrong and needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hear you, what you say, and I hope that the upcoming elections that uh, future uh, politicians will understand if people come first, as they do at the moment, we have to acknowledge production is stopping. People come first, we cannot produce, which is against every uh, production model of neo <laughs> neoliberal capitalism. And, um, but we also really have to ask for it there. It should be a right of the humanity to have access to health, access to education and access to the arts, like basic human rights. And how can we do that to have a better, better place? And that in a way some artists from Taiwan said, all of a sudden we are really connected. The entire world is mm -hmm. in the same boat now and the virus doesn't really care so much what it is, but it of course affects those who haven't planned well or who haven't been taken care of by people in power and politics who said our people come first and we do everything. And it looks like the White House has not done that. They have not listened and um, they did not provide for what is needed and we still don't have what we have. So again, thank you all and for, for, for coming, taking your time and energy. Uh, maybe we check in later on, who knows how long this da is, how the mood will change. Mm -hmm. um, join us tomorrow. We will have the great Big Dance Theater and uh, uh, NAB and Paul and then uh, together with the Nature Theater of Oklahoma to hear from their side, uh, from Pablo and Kelly, what, what they are thinking about, these creative minds who have a hard time even also finding their work here in New York. I think we're still on, but I don't think. Oh, did we lose Frank? Yeah, I think we lost. lost. Froze. Um, I'll, I'll text, chat him real quick. But I believe. Melanie and someone. Oh, here he comes. So, oh, there yeah, we go. Awesome for a second, Frank. Yeah. yeah, we have a Melanie of Aaron Lensman and Orange coming up, and then Shahid Nadim in Pakistan. And, and uh, Abhishek from uh, India. And um, so um, thank you all for taking the time. I'm sorry about the technical complication, but it was very important to hear from you, very moving and that honest talk you all did. Really, really thank you and um, stay safe and stay tuned. You and too. thanks to yeah. Brown and Dallas College for helping us out. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take thank care. You.